Good day, welcome to today's event. My name is Frank Fletcher, Director of Lectures and Seminars. I would like to uh, welcome everyone to the Geopolitics of Energy, the Saudi Aramco IPO, Implications and Considerations. Today, during the Q&A period, we'll be taking questions, but written on index cards that you'll find in your seats. If uh, anyone needs a pen or pencil, I will uh, have some back there and we'll be very glad to, if you raise your hand at various junctures, when a question occurs to you, I will give you something to write with. Um, moderating today's event, this panel discussion, will be Colonel Preston McLaughlin, who's a uh, retired uh, colonel from the Marine Corps. He is an associate professor of national security at Daniel Morgan Graduate School. Discussing the economic impact of the Saudi Aramco IPO and its implications for the U.S. investment community is Brigadier General Tom Cosentino, who had a distinguished career in the United States Army. He is currently the Chief Operating Officer of Business Executives for National Security. Discussing an inside view of Aramco in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is Rula Manasra, who is the former Director of Regional Security and Governmental Affairs for ConocoPhillips. She is currently the President and CEO of Lynx Intelligence. Discussing regional security issues will be Adam Seitz. He is a senior researcher and instructor at Marine Corps University in Quantico, Virginia. His specialty is the Middle East, in particular Yemen and the Houthis, which he's done a lot of work on. And then the net assessment of this discussion will be done by Paul Michael Wiebe, who is a research fellow here at Daniel Morgan Graduate School. He is also an adjunct professor at the University of Port Harcourt in Nigeria. Welcome and introducing the event and moderating will be Colonel McLaughlin and throughout the event when questions occur just raise your hand and I will take your index cards. Thank you. Thanks Frank. Good afternoon everyone. Uh, welcome. Um, I think today you're going to hear a very interesting topic, which is the initial public offering of shares for Aramco. Uh, so I'm going to very briefly kind of give you an overview and set the stage on why we study this as a topic. And then I'm going to turn it over to the expert panel where they're going to drill down on some specific issues. So if you look at the initial slide behind me, uh, the gentleman closest to me is the Chief Executive Officer, Amin Nasser, who had studied in the United States and has climbed the corporate ladder in Saudi Arabia with Aramco. Uh, the gentleman on the other side of the screen is Mohammed bin Salman bin Abdulaziz Al Saud, also known by his initials MBS. So I think today, for brevity's sake, you're going to hear MBS quite a bit. So the implications of the IPO is what we want to discuss. We here at Daniel Morgan look at energy as an integral part of national security affairs. A lot of times a country's national security policy may be inextricably tied to its energy policy. In the fall, we had two previous uh, energy panel events, and the topics are up on the screen uh, behind us. <coughs> and out of those panels, we came to some conclusions. In today's world, security issues are much, much more complex. Governance issues are more complex. And one of the things we discovered with the other panels is that inside the North American bloc with the United States, Canada, and Mexico, we are doing much better in the energy sector than we were a couple of years ago. So it also has a calculus on our national security policies. Uh, most of us in the room can remember the uh, OPEC oil crisis in 1973. Uh, a lot of us can also remember the 1988 Reflag Kuwaiti tanker war, uh, and then also Desert Shield, Desert Storm, which were direct impacts on American national security when it came to energy in the Middle East. But now I think we are a lot more uh, 
stable in our energy picture, so that impacts also our security policies. So if you've been following the news, uh, MBS has been on a, a world tour, and we're going to see a couple of uh, pictures of where he's been. But uh, in March, uh, Reuters put out a story uh, stating that he was going to go out and meet with people to help him think about his vision for the future, charting the future for Saudi Arabia. So where did he go? He obviously went to the White House. He also went to Hollywood, if you see uh, the rock up there with him in the picture. Then he also went to Silicon Valley because he's very interested in innovation. And he spent time with Mark Zuckerberg. He also spent some time with Richard Branson. So why is he doing this? He has something out there called Vision 2030, which is a plan for the future for Saudi Arabia. And it involves many different lines of operation. It talks about innovation, it talks about developing the workforce. So he has a very ambitious agenda in front of him. And again, not putting all his eggs in one basket, he went to Europe and visited in the UK and France, went to Brussels because he wants to hear what other governments are thinking about as he plans for the future. So today, these are our expert panelists, and they've been introduced. We're going to go in the order of the panelists uh, to my left, and they're going to give you about a 10-12 minute snapshot of their specific area. And then, as uh, Mr. Fletcher has said, we're going to collect questions from the audience and present those to the panel. So without further ado, I would like to uh, turn the platform over to Brigadier General Cosentino. Thank you, Preston. So um, I guess the, the, the big question is if, a, uh, if an IPO happens somewhere else in the world other than the New York Stock Exchange, did it happen as far as the American business community is concerned? What's the driving force? Why does it matter to us uh, if this IPO happens? And, um, you know, there's uh, uh, a couple things going on here. And I think uh, the first thing is to understand what's, you know, what's driving the prince's strategy, why he, uh, why he might want to uh, put 5% of the company up for sale, what does he plan to do with the money, and why does it matter if it happens in New York or not, and, uh, and on the New York Stock Exchange. And I think the, uh, the first thing to understand is that uh, Saudi Arabia, is, in many ways, is a hand-to-mouth economy. Um, they, uh, they ran uh, almost a $100 uh, billion dollar debt uh, just a couple years ago, the last records that I can find. And um, the, uh, their aspiration to move from a, um, a, a petroleum uh, a commodity based uh, economy to a more diversified economy is going to require a huge investment. Uh, investment in infrastructure, investment in education, and investment in, uh, in their people. And, and probably an, uh, an investment of time and prestige in, um, in a culture change, which they may or may not be able to pull off. Uh, that $100 billion is critical and it's necessary, but it's, it's, uh, it's definitely not sufficient uh, in order to pull it off. Uh, what they really need is they need U.S. business leading and European and other Western businesses to come to Saudi Arabia and invest in a diversified economy. And right now, there's some serious challenges uh, in that vision. Uh, the first one is that in order to get a, generate $100 billion worth of revenue, um, this company has got to be valued at $2 trillion. And, you know, best case today, maybe a trillion and a half, and probably less. So, um, 
you know, if they put this IPO out today on the New York Stock Exchange, it could be a dramatic failure for them in, in their ability to generate the income that they, they desire. That's one of the reasons why they, um, why they, it looks like they pushed it off now into, uh, into 2019. The bigger question I, I think that comes up is, you know, why would American uh, 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 investment firms, why would American business uh, be interested in it? Well, th at the bottom line, it's the cheapest oil in the world to, to bring out of the ground. So people are going to make a profit uh, on this IPO um, uh, if, they, if they invest, but is it going to, is that all that the prince is concerned with? No, he's trying to figure out how does he get American business then to turn around and help him diversify the economy. It's almost an advertising campaign as, it, as much as it is a cash generation campaign. Um, and that's a problem because right now Saudi Arabia is not an attractive place to invest. Um, it's got severe uh, transparency problems. Uh, it, uh, it doesn't have a workforce who's technically uh, educated and ready to take on the task of, of diversifying the economy. It's, it, it's not going to happen today. And, it, and they need a lot of help, and they're not taking the steps uh, to actually make that happen. There's a lot of talk about those steps, but the, the steps to make it happen um, aren't, aren't in play right now. The other, uh, the other reason why they've pulled this IPO back, besides the fact that the company is not valued at what they need it to be valued at to, to actually uh, generate the income, is that when you, when you list on the New York Stock Exchange, there's a, uh, uh, a high level of requirements for transparency and, and, and governance standards for a company that Aramco, we don't know. We don't know what their governance standards are because they don't share it. They've never shared it. They keep the, the company information close just like every other uh, state-owned oil company in the Middle East. And, and therefore, they would really have to kind of open up uh, the curtain to let the whole world look behind what's happening in Saudi Aramco and, and in larger sense, what's happening in the, in the Saudi government and economy. Um, and they're not ready to do that yet. So they have to figure that out. Um, where does that take us then? So I think where, where it takes us is that uh, I don't know if they're going to list it on New York Stock Exchange. I think Prince Mohammed bin Salman is committed to, um, to an IPO uh, and committed to generating these resources to do the infrastructure builds, the education change, and the reforms that he wants to do. But I don't think he's going to put it on New York Stock Exchange as of today. I think, you know, more likely, maybe the Chinese buy it for cash, uh, or it goes on the exchange in Singapore, someplace else. And then that leads to the question, yes, he got the money, but what gets American business into Saudi Arabia? There are many more places around the world, including today the United States, that are more attractive for, for U.S. businesses to invest in than Saudi Arabia where the conditions are already set from a regulatory standpoint, from an educated workforce, from an infrastructure standpoint, to make a profit. Now, there are other areas in Saudi Arabia that could be exploited, uranium mining, but then we're back to commodities. And we're not actually putting uh, the workforce, uh, we're not generating the six million jobs that he wants to generate. Um, so this is a challenge. And um, I'm not quite sure that the Saudis have a strategy or a plan to work through the challenge. Uh, if they want U.S. and Western business to go to Saudi Arabia to, to invest in labor-intensive um, uh, downstream industries, it's going to take actually real reform and a real commitment and a re-education of their workforce to be committed to work, you know, work a full day, to, to get their hands dirty and, and do work 
you know, manual labor um, to, uh, to get the uh, educated classes trained and, and uh, you know, uh, embrace a culture of, of uh, dynamic change. Which, which includes a, a um, you know, probably a much more uh, busy culture right now than what they have when it comes to their work day. All of these are challenges for the prince, uh, and I'm not sure how he's, gonna, uh, how he's actually gonna lead and pull those off uh, uh, right now. So, what does that mean? If they don't make the culture changes, the regulatory changes, the anti-corruption measures, um, our business leaders at Benz have a saying whenever we engage internationally, that capital goes where it's welcome and stays where it's best treated. And uh, today, that's not Saudi Arabia. Um, and uh, I would say that there's, there are, uh, are really good solid reasons why they've, they've delayed this IPO. And without a major change uh, in the strategic approach to, to why they're doing the IPO and what they hope to accomplish, uh, I, don't see, I don't see a, a flood of American business investment into Saudi Arabia. I see a sale of about 5% of the company to somebody, China, investment, uh, you know, investment firms on the Singapore market, uh, or something like that. And when it happens, uh, there'll be a, a, an influx of money and there'll be a lot of building in Saudi Arabia. But I don't know if it accomplishes the uh, strategic objectives of uh, MBS's 2030 strategy or his plan. Um, so if, a, if an IPO happens out of the United States, did it happen at all? If, if American business doesn't embrace it, um, I don't know. It's a, I think the question is a, is a due out. By the way, though, it will be the biggest IPO in history if it does happen. Um, the, the previous biggest was uh, Petrobras at, at, at about $70 billion raised. Um, this one would be bigger. And, um, you know, we'll see. Okay, that's, I think, enough to start. <clears throat> thank you, General. Uh, thank you, uh, Frank, for the kind introduction and to Daniel Morgan Graduate School for uh, putting together this panel. So, the picture speaks a thousand words, and um, I want to point to the beginning of the bilateral relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia. 73 years ago, on a very special Valentine's Day, um, this picture was taken uh, for a meeting between President Franklin Roosevelt and King Abdulaziz ibn Saud of Saudi Arabia. And many people view this historic meeting as the beginning of bilateral relations between the United States and Saudi Arabia. But the reality is it actually extended almost a decade earlier um, into uh, the 1930s when Standard Oil was granted a concession by the Saudi government to be able to enter the kingdom, explore, and drill for oil. So that really marked the beginning of commercial uh, relationship between the United States and Saudi Arabia. The commercial relations have continued to prosper uh, throughout the years. Um, it's created opportunities within the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, taking it from essentially uh, a Bedouin style culture uh, to one that had a thriving oil-based economy. They built a great deal of infrastructure, roads, uh, transportation systems, and so much more. Also educational institutions. And what's interesting is that when the United States uh, had, or Standard Oil had um, entered Saudi Arabia, the early geologists at the time worked alongside the Saudi nationals in the various um, drilling locations, and they brought with them a lot of technology. It was new technology. They brought with them knowledge, um, and there were knowledge transfers, and there was a great deal of skill building and capacity building for the Saudi population. With it also came cultural exchange. So 
the new skills and the new technology really provided an opportunity for further investment of U.S. companies to start to enter Saudi Arabia um, as oil had been discovered and the economy continued to grow. I believe we're at a very similar junction in history today and National Vision 2030 is probably going to be very similar to a moment in history just like the picture between FDR and Ibn Saud. There's bold leadership top-down leadership within the kingdom, and rapid change that's underway. A couple years ago, Mohammed bin Salman was interviewed when he was still the deputy crown prince by Al Arabiya, and the ratings for that interview were through the roof. Um, Saudis under 30 account for 60% of the population, and these pillars that Mohammed bin Salman had been talking about were very popular uh, amongst that demographic, but also amongst a wider population within the kingdom. He was talking about reform, and as you can see here, he was talking about the um, Aramco IPO. That was the first time that the uh, concept had been discussed, and the $2 trillion valuation was given. At the time, you know, it's possible that the calculations uh, did in fact point to a $2 trillion uh, calculation, but as the price of oil can be volatile, that might go um, below the two trillion, um, as the general has pointed out. Um, also, uh, there was a great deal of emphasis on the need to build infrastructure, and there were certain challenges um, in what he talked about, such as lifting of subsidies. But the majority of the Saudi population is not under the poverty line, and they really don't need these government subsidies to be able to sustain. In fact, the subsidies are unsustainable and the Saudi leadership is aware of that. Anytime you have reform or change, it's gonna bring on challenges. There was a cultural reform that's already been in uh, play. We just saw the opening of the first movie theater in Saudi Arabia. Although, as someone who grew up in Aramco, I can say that there was a movie theater uh, much earlier, and that's one of the benefits of uh, the cultural exchanges that take place between U.S. and Saudi relations. Uh, there's social reform. The Crown Prince talked about lifting the powers of the, uh, um, the religious police, um, or Matawas as they're known, and that was a huge sweeping reform. Also, he talked about women's rights and advancing women's rights, um, not just on the big issue of driving for women, but also uh, having educational institutions that are co-ed institutions. And the enforcement of anti-corruption laws and encouraging a more moderate practice of Islam, removing subsidies. Again, these have their positives, but they also have their challenges because there are elements of society that will try to challenge this and try to oppose any change that is going to impact their well-being. Regardless though, that top-down leadership is very adamant to be able to push forward that sweeping change, and the majority of the population is very eager to accept and take on these reforms and reap the benefits of what will come of that. Therefore, there is a great deal of support of the Crown Prince's efforts within the kingdom. Saudi Arabia's leadership is, has known for uh, decades that Aramco will need to change its strategy in terms of the funding of subsidies and the kingdom being highly reliant on the oil revenues that are generated from Aramco. So the diversification of the economy, but also the energy portfolio within Saudi Aramco is the one that's very important and has been talked about since the 1970s. Now we're looking at um, Aramco looking into renewables, nuclear energy, and other such um, diversification opportunities. While all of this is very ambitious, um, through ambitious leaders and there is an ambitious timeline of 2030. There have been now public announcements made and therefore the accountability is there from the society and from the global community. There will be increased commercial diplomacy and by the way, there's already a great deal of foreign direct investment that 
has taken place within the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. There are a great number of Fortune 500 companies already established and have uh, com businesses within the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. There are corporate social responsibility opportunities to help develop the workforce, develop the youth, create cultural exchanges and leadership opportunities such as uh, educational exchanges that take place between uh, Saudi Arabia and some of the universities um, here in, in the United States. While Aramco you know, is operated as a national oil company, it still has the same standards as any other uh, commercial entity and large enterprise. It needs to maintain commerciality, profitability, and answer to a wide range of stakeholders. The IPO will be essential uh, for the Saudi national vision to go forward, um, but the kingdom does not want to entirely be reliant on the oil revenues of Aramco. From an investment standpoint, uh, world energy demand is growing. Aramco will continue to be the lowest cost supplier um, in the market, and therefore investment into the Aramco IPO would be very positive and pay dividends. I do believe that the Aramco IPO will help fund the national vision and be able to move uh, the liquid funds into the public investment fund, which is really necessary to be able to invest both locally and um, outside of, of Saudi Arabia, even in the United States. And the two-way commercial exchange will be a very positive opportunity for the stakeholders involved. Pro probably most exciting is the mega cities um, that Saudi Arabia has uh, started on plans for building, such as Neon. This will radically change the economy and provide opportunities for that new technology for the diversification of their energy portfolio and uh, new capacity building opportunities for their youth. Um, just the national vision projects alone are expected to bring forward six million jobs for youth by 2030. Um, this is really a tremendous uh, opportunity for the kingdom to be able to develop the skills of their workforce and their nationals, and it will give a great deal of satisfaction to the Saudi nationals because the current situation of a growing uh, jobless rates within the kingdom is something that can cause potential instability down the line if it's not handled properly. So there will be a, a great amount of um, cultural opportunities, business opportunities, social reform opportunities, and my view on the future of Saudi Arabia is that it is looking up and up. Um, I think that there is a tremendous opportunity for a great profit and uh, further investment within the kingdom. And finally, the re robust geostrategic position of Saudi Arabia will be a site not just for economic reform and mega cities and mega reform, but also a renaissance throughout the region. Thank you. Uh, thank you, my fellow panelists, for setting me up well. And uh, thank you for the invitation to Dan Morton School for uh, hosting this panel today. I've been asked to address uh, regional security issues today. And although there are many issues I could address, uh, I'm going to focus my remarks on the security situ situation in Yemen and the security implications that has for the Saudi Aramco IPO and the Vision 2030 more broadly. <clears throat> As uh, both the panelists have kind of already laid out, that the Saudi Arabia, Saudi Arabia's uh, Aramco IPO is only one uh, of the first steps, I'll be, I'll be a crucial one, of the much broader Vision 2030 roadmap to reimagine the Saudi economy. Um, a recent surge, uh, We've seen a recent surge in uh, oil prices and crude oil prices, um, and much of this has been fueled uh, by the geopolitical tensions and security concerns in the Middle East. 
while this may potentially provide greater valuation for the Saudi Ramco IPO and temporary economic uh, uh, economic stopgap for Saudi Arabia, especially with regards to national security and defense spending. The same regional security concerns driving the surge in uh, prices poses secure, uh, serious challenges as Riyadh will pivot uh, from the IPO to the rest of the ambitious economic reform agenda, uh, especially as it courts potential foreign investors and moves to build a diversified economy. So. We can go back to the third pillar of Saudi Arabia's, uh, Saudi Arabia's Vision 2030, um, which is transforming our unique strategic location into a global hub connecting three continents, Asia, Europe, and Africa. Our geographic position between key global waterways makes the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia an epicenter of trade and a gateway to the world. But this geographic position and strategic location can be something of a double-edged sword especially in a region plagued by geopolitical competition and internal instability. Uh, moreover, Saudi Arabia is not the only actor seeking to leverage its geographic position and strategic location to dig itself out of a hole. The ongoing conflict in Yemen represents a significant geopolitical flashpoint in a strategic corner of the region and a case that highlights the intersection of geopolitical competition internal war and broader regional and international security challenges that Riyadh faces as it moves forward with the economic and social reforms in an effort to transform the Saudi economy under Vision 2030. So in a survey published by the EU in 2009, the most common response to a question, how is Yemen going to get itself out of its troubles? Uh, the most common answer was, we'll blackmail our neighbors. The statement uh, to me underscores both the domestic understanding of Yemen's economic dependence on external actors and foreign preoccupation with security challenges in South West, West Arabia. Such thinking plays a role in shaping Yemen's internal elite competition as well as domestic relations and, foreign, and its foreign policy. Moreover, as we're talking about the Vision 2030, this blackmail or neighbor, neighbor thinking does not bode well for Saudi Arabia, or Saudi Arabia as it embarks on realizing Vision 2030. For Riyadh, Houthi expansion, expansionism in Yemen is tantamount to Iranian expansionism along Saudi Arabia's long and poor southern border and potential Iranian influence along two of the region's most strategic waterways. For Tehran, the conflict in Yemen is a low-cost, high-reward theater, requiring few resources and providing ambiguity as to its involvement, while straining Saudi, Saudi Arabia and its allies politically, economically, and militarily, and distracting Riyadh from Iran's activities elsewhere. Uh, Tehran has been opportunistic and is uh, attempting to capitalize on this thinking of blackmail or neighbor that, uh, uh, in Yemen, this mentality, uh, along with the amb ambiguity that the internal operating environment has provided. While the extent of Iranian support and influence in Yemen is, is debatable, there is substantial evidence of Iranian technology and weapons transfers to Yemen, including some drone and missile technology. Such transfers have had a significant Im impact on the threat perception and security calculus of Saudi, Saudi Arabia, as well as the strategies of various military, political, and tribal factions in Yemen. So, on the slide here, this is just to outlay some of this blackmail on our neighbor ID, this, this mentality, and how Saudi Arabia sees the threat emanating from Yemen, and how also Yemen sees Saudi Arabia. Um, so, with an Aramco refinery complex at its anchor, the Jazan Economic City in southwest Jazan province has been described by Aramco as pivotal, pivotal in delivering the economic transformation in the region and attracting foreign investment, and is considered a springboard for the economic diversification under the Kingdom's Vision 2030 economic roadmap. And Jazan, if you can see on the map, I don't know if this will, uh, good. Jazan province is right here, which is kind of a problem as we talk about Yemen and security challenges. Uh, the 400,000 barrel a day facility is expected to be fully operational in 2019, um, however, again, Jazan province uh, borders the Sada province in Yemen, which is the stronghold of Houthi rebels and has seen 
and, and thus has seen significant spillover and targeting uh, by the Houthis. Um, <clears throat> so almost a year ago today, Saudi forces foiled an attempted attack with a remote controlled boat laden with explosives on an oil production distribution center in Jizan. And while recent missile attacks targeting Riyadh have made a lot of headlines, Jizan, owing in part to this proximity to Yemen, has continued to see a more constant uh, barrage of attacks from Yemen. In recent months, attacks targeting the oil industry and civilian areas in particular uh, have been on the rise in this region. It is not only the number, which uh, now number over 100 missile, launch, uh, missile strikes uh, over the past three years, and the increased range, of course, uh, targeting Riyadh, but also, what may be more worris worrisome is the diversity in terms of the methods and delivery of these attacks, ranging from artillery and missile launches to drones and remote controlled boats. There are recently two drones intercepted, um, and those drones, uh, that technology uh, se seems to have been transferred from Iran. And those drones can be used for surveillance, but also for targeting air defenses, so, uh, and, and would be hard to intercept in that way. In addition to Houthi attacks on tankers and other ships transiting the Red Sea and threats by the Houthis to mine the Bab del Mandeb, similar to threats by Iran to close the Straits of Hormuz, the threat posed by AQAP uh, to the freedom of navigation and its ability to harass commercial traffic has increased as the Yemen conflict has dragged on, including speculation that AQAP was responsible for a 2007 attack on a tanker tra transiting the Bab del Mandeb. Uh, the threats emanating from Yemen are complex, ranging from the threats to oil infrastructure and freedom of navigation, which threaten the entire global economy. Uh, this comes from the Houthis, but also some other actors within the country have a vested interest in similar attacks to, lever to, to gain leverage in negotiations, uh, and for other reasons. Uh, to Iran meddling in Saudi Arabia's backyard amidst heightened regional tensions and geopolitical competition, to growing threat posed by jihadists such as AQAP and the Islamic State. As they continue to take advantage, as these groups continue to take advantage of the security vacuum, elite competition taking on not only among elites within Yemen, but also some of the foreign uh, actors uh, currently in that country taking part in the conflict, and also general warlordism in Yemen. Uh, such threats pose significant challenges to Saudi, region, Saudi Arabia's Vision 2030 roadmap, not only by diverting economic resources, including the potential sale, the, the, the revenue from the potential sale of Saudi Aramco, uh, but uh, which, which all of this is needed for infrastructure pro projects and reform efforts to spur investment uh, and also attract foreign investors uh, for industries beyond the oil industry in Saudi Aramco. So again, I would say that the same factors that right now are driving a surge in oil prices and may be for the short term good for Saudi Arabia in terms of the Aramco IPO and possibly goes into part of the thinking of putting off selling that, um, will pose serious challenges as it moves forward for, with Vision 2030 as it tries to pivot back to uh, gaining the investment and working over investors trying to get the uh, trying to uh, invest in infrastructure projects and diversification efforts in the economy. So um, I'll leave uh, that here and, and, and welcome questions. Uh, and, and those questions can be on, be beyond the Yemen uh, issue as well. So. Thank you, Adam. Um, I want to acknowledge the uh, unique expertise of our panel members and the diverse perspective they bring to this really quite critical issue. Arula Manasra has made the case for Vision 2030, wherein the Aramco IPO is essential for its implementation and overall success. Vision 2030 is commendable, laudable, bold, and progressive. But there are serious questions to be asked about it 
based on the Aramco IPO issue. General Cosentino has described the inherent challenges facing Saudi Arabia and the inherent challenges that the investment community will have in terms of judging the viability of the Aramco IPO and in turn the viability of the 2030 vision. Adam Seitz has provided prognosis of regional security conditions and circumstances, which opens up numerous portals to how the United States will evaluate its national security interests and requirements in that part of the world, and wherein the Aramco IPO is a critical factor in determining U.S. regional policy, U.S. energy policy, and ultimately a U.S. national security directive, which is embodied in the most recent tweet of President Trump criticizing OPEC and the acceleration of oil prices. And we'll get to that in just a moment. However, let me say, as we discuss geopolitics of energy, and this is our third uh, lecture in a series, uh, the President's tweet, I suppose, is the penultimate expression of energy geopolitics. And we thank him for that. Now, what I'd like to do is provide a net assessment of the presentations made today. But rather than offer a conventional or traditional evaluation with implicit and explicit recommendations and conclusions. What I prefer to do is to ask a number of questions arising from the substance of the presentations of each of the panelists that I think or I believe an investment banker, a hedge fund manager, a government or security analyst, or an oil and gas executive might ask as regarding the possibility of investment into the IPO. And there are four basic questions. I think. Let me just run those down. Number one, is there a geopolitical or security risk and what is it to my potential investment in such an IPO? Second, how can Saudi Arabia sustain spending one-third of its budget on military and security allocations without much higher oil prices? Third, is it realistic for an IPO of $50 billion or maxing it out to $100 billion to kickstart a 12-year, $4 trillion estimated socioeconomic development plan? And fourth, if indeed the Aramco evaluation of $2 trillion or as General Constantino has said, and I believe correctly, much less than that, maybe just a trillion or under a trillion. If that's linked to oil prices, who sets the oil price? And how do you set it? Going back now to that first question, the geopolitical and security risk factor. From the American perspective, why would the investment community 
commit itself to the IPO when Saudi Arabia is in fact the epicenter of four cold and hot wars with four of its neighbors, namely Syria, Yemen, Qatar, and Iran. Do any of these countries actually pose an existential threat to Saudi Arabia, thereby justifying massive military allocations? And if indeed, in the case of Iran, it is an existential threat, why would I, as a U.S. investor, commit funds to Aramco, which is the ground zero target for any missile strikes from Yemen and or Iran. The fundamental question here for Vision 2030 is, is Vision 2030 committing itself to a wartime economy or a peacetime economy? On the second question and related, 2018 budget for Saudi Arabia is estimated at $260 billion U.S., of which approximately $80 billion, almost one-third, is devoted to military and security spending requirements, creating additional deficit, primarily arising from the war in Yemen. How is this spending on military equipment and operational requirements pertaining to Saudi Arabia and Vietnam? How is this sustainable without higher oil prices? And is this indeed the reason for Saudi Arabia leading OPEC, OPEC plus Russia, to move prices higher by capping production levels. That's different than capping production levels in order to move the market. If you're capping production levels in order to sustain a war effort, then the risk premium goes much higher. And credit agencies will have a field day with the ratings. And they are. And with this in mind, who can guarantee the higher oil prices that Saudi Arabia needs to sustain 2030 vision and to continue its wartime economy? And does Saudi Arabia within 2030 vision have an alternative geostrategic plan for the region based on peace agreements or truce negotiations with its neighbors. Show me those and I might show you great investment into you. Yeah. Third question. We already have models released through Bloomberg and through the Financial Times where the valuation of Aramco is pegged at almost a trillion dollars to the two trillion dollars that has been discussed. That two trillion dollars is pegged to one hundred dollar a barrel oil or higher. And keep in mind this tweet by President Trump when I mentioned these figures. So the Aramco valuation is to be based on the oil price. And a high oil price in order to achieve the one bill the one hundred billion dollar draw. Problem with that is you have to sustain the oil price at that level. 
in order to secure that type of investment, whether it's from the Americans or the Chinese or anybody else. And the last time, or the two times we saw oil reach $100 <coughs> or more, 2008, 9, and then 2014, we had a crash in oil prices. 2008 led to recession. Keep in mind what the president has tweeted. In other words, the push for higher oil prices, which is being engineered by Saudi Arabia to try and secure the $100 billion on the IPO and maintain its wartime economy, is not sustainable from an economic point of view, based on precedent in the oil market. There's too much oil slushing around in the market. The geopolitical aspects of the market, bombing oil pipelines in Libya, stopping Canadian Heavy crude from reaching markets, almost 2 million barrels are now stalled because of regulatory and legal challenges. All of these issues indicate, in fact, that the real price of crude oil is much less than what it is that the Saudis need to validate the IPO and to sustain their military spending. And if you can't secure $100 billion for Vision 2030, which is laudable and, and commendable, as I said earlier, how can you do it with the more realistic figure of a valuation of $1 trillion and a draw of $50 billion? The $50 billion becomes, or even $100 billion, is only a temporary one to two year bridge If you really want to make this the, the uh, cornerstone of this massive and wonderful project, forget 5%, open it up to 20, 25%. And then you're talking business. Keep it at 5%, and the issues that General Constantino mentioned, lack of transparency, um, uh, and question marks pertaining to the viability of these projects will overwhelm the calculations of those who might be predisposed to invest into the IPO anyways. And then we come to this PowerPoint slide you see to the back of me. Oil prices are critical, essential. You cannot have the IPO without pegging it to the oil price. The higher the oil price, the more valuation. So what's, what's the price that investors are looking at to validate an investment? Back in October 30th, <coughs> at our second geopolitics of energy event, I said, it's, it's, there's a quote right here, it's on YouTube. I said at that time that it's in the U.S. national security interest that oil prices sustain themselves in the low 40s to low 60s. In other words, that's a sweet spot. And good for consumers, good for producers. Likely to prevent collapse of regimes dependent on oil revenue including Saudi Arabia, if they know how to manage their revenues, and if they know how to manage their foreign policy and military expenditures based on that foreign policy. Now the president 
validates that statement that I made on behalf of DMGS. The president makes it clear that prices are trending upwards and it's not acceptable because, I believe, the administration realizes that this, these are artificially high prices being generated for non-market purposes. Can the U.S., can this administration affect oil prices? I think that's what any investor or analyst would like to know. Yes, the market operates, but oil is the only commodity in the world that's really not traded freely. Okay. We have layers and layers of cost in, inherent in the commodity. Everything from manipulation to, sustain, to, uh, to speculation, to geopolitics, to the deliberate stoppage of, of uh, downstream facilities exporting or importing crude and natural gas. The issue here, then, in regarding President Trump's tweet, is that the United States will not tolerate high oil prices, thereby jeopardizing the valuation of the IPO, which really has to be factored on the dollar's barrel. Does the United States have a toolbox to bring down the price of oil into that sweet spot, in my opinion? In my opinion, yes. We're not going to discuss that now. But there's a number of ways to do that. Economic fiscal, and geopolitical. And that's a message to the crown prince himself. This administration operates on, on an America first policy frame. This administration wants low priced energy sources, low price gasoline, low price diesel, low price fuels for industrial and commercial expansion and growth and job creation. You're not going to get that with $80 a barrel oil or $100 a barrel oil. Now, will the Saudis listen? And will they try to reach an accommodation on oil prices? Or can they depend on Russia, which is a critical partner in keeping prices high? We have a lot of options here, as far as I'm concerned, that can be exercised to address these issues. So Vision 2030, the IPO, all dependent on oil prices, and the United States is the critical player in determining whether or not Vision 2030 will be implemented and whether it will succeed. Thank you. Okay, thank you, panelists. Uh, very good uh, discussion today, and uh, we have some excellent questions from the audience. Uh, some of these questions are duplicates, so I'm going to I'm going to move them to the back of the pile. Uh, but I will try to get it to at least one question per card. Uh, some folks were ambitious and had more than one question per card. Okay, this is for the uh, full panel. It says, Brigadier General Cosentino mentioned the challenges of behavior change. Is this truly achievable by 2030, at least to the required level? I guess the required level is sustainability. So would you each comment on that question on behavior change? So, um, 
I think it could be possible. Um, what I don't know is if uh, if the Crown Prince has the um, uh, internal support for it. Uh, there is an educated population. They're educated on the wrong things. Sent to liberal arts programs, poli-sci programs around the world. There are a certain amount of engineers who are, who are focused on the uh, mechanics of overseeing the oil industry, but there's also a large ex expatriate population that does the, the hand, hands-on work. Um, could they reform, um, uh, institute a cultural change? I mean, this is a huge, um, almost a huge turnover type of, uh, of uh, operation for a country as opposed to a, a company, where you'd have to, you know, uh, assemble the leadership, sell the strategy, uh, come up with a, uh, a very aggressive plan to educate at the, the uh, uh, kind of elite level a different way of doing business uh, with, a, with a, uh, a focus on um, uh, uh, free market and expansion. And then you'd have to get uh, massive skills training down to those you know, millions of uh, largely Shia, Eastern Eastern Saudi Arabians. The huge undertaking would need the hundred billion dollars for sure, plus more out of the um, uh, out of the IPO, but probably have to redirect other money that that's going to buy uh, weapons and and other capability, and then build a campaign and stick to it. That's that's a hard undertaking to do it from a, a, sta a state-centered um, effort. You know, in, you know in, a, in a free market economy of scale like the U.S., this happens in pockets and some places fall by the wayside and they don't adapt to, the, to changing economy. Other places adapt very quickly. But we have a benefit of, of uh, having that kind of culture already built in in the U.S and having scale. P people could pick up and move from the middle of Ohio to Silicon Valley, or they can move to, to Georgia, or wherever the, the opportunities are. That's going to be a challenge for the uh, uh, for settled uh, culture uh, like Saudi Arabia. And uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to require a, an extremely detailed uh, plan and an aggressive transformation strategy and the buy-in of the people. I also don't see how you can only, how you do that with only half the population. So, you know, we're going to have to go from way past, um, uh, you know, talking about letting women drive to uh, a, an education process for the women of Saudi Arabia, including skilled, uh, skilled labor to get them into the workforce. Is, is that possible? Yes, it's possible. Is it possible by 2030? I, I'm doubtful. Uh, I think a more reasonable approach would be to take an, kind of an ink spot strategy and focus on particular sectors of the economy um, uh, and uh, reform of governance, um, you know, governance processes and try to work this, you know, over a multi-decade uh, time frame. Um, if it's sold right, I think that that would be very popular with the people and uh, you wouldn't have to achieve um, what may be uh, unachievable goals by 2030. Rula, would you have any comments? Uh, yeah, I'm, I agree with a lot of the challenges that uh, General Constantino pointed to, um, but from a behavior change standpoint, I believe that uh, Saudi Arabia especially the, the biggest population within Saudi Arabia being 60% below the age of 30, um, they are already exposed to so much from a cultural standpoint and they're yearning and they're eager for this change and they're eager for the reform. Um, I think that, you know, with changes such as women being able to drive, um, you know, there is going to be opposition and that's normal um, in any change environment. However, the corporate culture uh, that Western companies are used to 
has transcended into Saudi Arabia and already exists uh, in large part with lots of the multinational corporations that happen to be present there and employ Saudis. And Saudi Arabia has had a, a national development program in place through the Saudiization um, program and cultural exchanges, educational exchanges, that I, as I had pointed to. So I think that there is a great deal of potential, um, but it does need to be played right. And I just want to point also that Saudis are very proud of their culture. And um, if you look at the Emirates as an example, as a successful story of having built mega cities and transforming the landscape from desert into what the mega cities um, point to today. You, you see that uh, in Arab culture, they're still very proud of maintaining their heritage and their way of life. And it's a very interesting blend between US corporate culture and um, how we do business, and at the same time being able to uh, maintain what is important to the culture and the society. So the behavior change might not be what we're used to, uh, but there will definitely be progress in that area. And it's already started and it will continue to grow in the future, in my opinion. Thank you. Uh, I would echo both my panelists, what, what fellow panelists said, but I would also say one of the challenges though with doing this, with moving to you know, a Saudi workforce, there's the cultural change and, and everything else, the social changes, but also you're pushing out the foreign workers as well and, and, and changing that dynamic. So you're going to have other issues associated with that. We also see you know, some of the reforms that have already been made have pushed some of the foreign workers out of the country. And some of those are Yemenis that have gone back and now joined the, the insurgency in the north, the, 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 the Houthi rebels in the north and others. So this creates other problems, um, aside from the cultural and social changes there that, that need to take place. Uh, so um, that's, that's really all I'd add to that. Thanks. Paul? Good. Okay, next question is for Rula. <clears throat> Would MBS have pursued the much ballyhooed liberalization campaign at home, independent of the impending IPO? I think that the Saudi National Vision 2030, um, which he's at the helm of, is absolutely something that was planned for and would and will go forward, um, regardless of the Aramco IPO. The IPO is a vehicle for funding the vision, um, but the vision is there, and again, a largely receptive uh, demographic and population that want to see this growth. And beyond just Saudi Arabia as well, I mean, just to point to Neom as the megacity example, um, this is something that will transform that region, the geostrategic location of Saudi Arabia being on the Red Sea and the opportunity that it will provide for Saudi nationals, but other Arab nationals from the region is going to be an opportunity um, moving forward. Thank you. Okay, this question is for Adam. What is your assessment of the threat to Saudi oil infrastructure from missile attacks? Um, I, I still feel that, that the infrastructure is relatively safe. I think that the, that the Saudis have did a good job at intercepting uh, the, these, these missiles. But again, the delivery systems are starting to change. We're seeing different methods used. And the threats create barriers uh, more, than, more so sometimes than the actual a missile hitting or anything else, a missile strike that, that hits a target. The perception right now um, in some of these areas are no-goes near the southern borders, so that, that creates issues um, as is. But you, I think that the biggest problem is not the effectiveness of the strikes right now, but the effectiveness of uh, really shaping the, shaping the security calculus of Saudi Arabia and shaping perceptions, especially for investors and others. So I, I would say that I don't think that, uh, you know, that the, the strikes are actually being effective in hitting targets and, and actually threatening oil infrastructure, but I think they are having an effect on, especially outside investors, inside Saudi Arabia. I don't think this is a big, you know, it's, it's not really something talked about or anything else by Saudi. They have other things that uh, they, they really don't see it or care about much. Even the strikes in Riyadh didn't really register as much in Saudi Arabia or at the airport. Didn't, didn't really hit, hit too much uh, uh, there. But 
I would say that the, the perception, though, is starting to grow that there is an issue, um, and especially, I think, for outside investment and others in the international community. Um, this is a big deal about the oil tanker that was hit recently in route to, uh, to Egypt that had to go back. To, that's, an, that's another issue as well. But, you know, these are all connected, but they're all part of a um, strategy by the Houthis and other groups to, I think, really change the calculus with Saudi Arabia vis-a-vis -vis Yemen, so. Thank you. Next question is for Paul Michael. Is it in the national interest of the U.S. to break OPEC? It's in the national interest of the United States to reduce oil prices, and if as a consequence of those actions, the cartel is split or weakened, yes, it's in the U.S. national security interest of the United States to do so. Are there ways of doing it? Yes, there are ways of doing it, and not, not the least of which is the market operating the way it is as a consequence of the great success of U.S. shale producers of crude oil. The application of U.S. technology creating unbelievable cost efficiencies. Those technologies, essentially exclusive to the United States at this time, include automated offshore rigs, sensors embedded in drilling rigs, the fantastic loop, the Louisiana offshore oil port, which can now take Suez Max tankers, which go through the Panama Canal, and inject 100,000 barrels per hour into those tankers. You know, so it's an industrial scale export of U.S. crude to the Asian markets, taking away valuable, essential, historic market share from the Saudis. The Russians to a lesser extent, but the Saudis are the case in point. The issue then is the United States, because of this tremendous technology, because of innovations, because of changes in tax and regulation and export policy, and the quality of our crude, don't forget, uh, shale oil is light, sweet crude. So you only have one run refinery, said two or three runs with heavy oil. And Saudi oil is heavy, or heavier API, costs more. I mean, they blend Nigerian light crude into Saudi heavy crude. Okay. So the fact of the matter is, allowing the market to operate as it has operated over the last few years has changed the oil market and the United States is emerging as a swing producer. But if there is a threat to our economy because oil <coughs> prices are being engineered to go above $100 a barrel and we could have a replication of the 2008-2009 recession, yes, the U.S. government is fully justified to intervene and use whatever tools in the toolbox to bring down the price of oil. And I'm going to give you one example geopolitically <coughs> to send a message to the Saudis. You keep on doing what you're doing as leader of the cartel, as leader of OPEC. Well, we, I, Donald Trump, the administration, may decide to delay our withdrawal from the Iranian nuclear deal. That sends a pretty powerful message. So we have a lot of options we can exercise. That's one example. Can I offer a, yeah, so the only thing I would say on it is we're part of the cartel now, okay? It's, uh, oil has actually become um, uh, critical to our economy, uh, achieving the right balance um, of, of price. And I actually think 
when when Paul Michael said this at 40 to 60 last year, that was probably the consensus. I think the consensus now is the, the right balance for the U.S. economy, the way we're heated up, uh, the demand that's out there, um, the, the fact that we're operating at, at max uh, employment is about 60 to $70 because we're making a hell of a lot of money uh, uh, from the uh, it pumping into the economy from the sale of oil and natural gas. Um, so I, I would just, I, I wouldn't, <coughs> I wouldn't put us as it's the U.S. against OPEC and the Russians. It's the U.S. working with OPEC and the Russians to find a balance to uh, to the appropriate price. And you're right, Paul Michael. Any particular one of the those players could try to seize an advantage and manipulate. But I I think the ability to do that now, given the huge reserves that are clearly uh, capable of being tapped in the U.S. through uh, uh, shale drilling and technology is gone. Nobody can manipulate the market right now anymore. It's everybody's, somebody manipulates, you know, they're, they're not really, it, it, the, the, uh, uh, it's all fungible and it's going to move um, around. We, you know, it's, it, the price is, we don't, I don't know where the balance is, but there's a reason why we also let our reserves run down so that we could kind of get into, just like the Saudis did and the, and the Emiratis and the Russians, to try to get into this 60 to $70 range where everybody's making money. Um, we're, we're actually making more money with less, because it's just a piece of our economy. Okay, for brevity's sake, we're at time, so I've got one last question I'm going to ask each panelist to briefly comment on. Uh, thank you for the questions. They were excellent. good number of them. I think the panelists have answered them in some of the other responses. But the last question is, for consideration, could Saudi Arabian export crude oil to China, and has MBS visited China or engaged him on his world tour? What are the implications of China with the IPO? I mean, it's it's a global market. Of course, they're going to buy. The Chinese are going to buy it wherever, just like like everybody else does, wherever they can get it cheaper. I I think the question of why would the Chinese maybe make a huge investment in the IPO? Um, uh, it's for the security of the oil, so that they have a partnership to get it when they need it. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, there's a demand and there's a supply, and, and whether the Chinese buy from the Saudis, or whether they buy from the Russians, or whether they buy for, from us, from a market standpoint is kind of irrelevant. It's fungible wherever it's at, because we got plenty of supply. Um, so yeah, I mean, they might, because, and, and I, I personally believe that's a good thing. Um, if they're buying from Saudi Arabia, the chances of conflict over the uh, South China Sea um, goes down because they have a steady supply of oil. Um, so, it, it, you know, it's really, it's a fungible uh, uh, situation. <coughs> uh, Saudi Arabia has been uh, China's largest um, oil uh, supplier. Um, and will continue to be an energy supplier to China. Um, if you look at the Chinese One Belt, One Road, um, they understand the importance of the geostrategic uh, location of uh, Saudi Arabia and Southeast Asian countries, et cetera, to be able to link um, the uh, oil supplies to China. Um, you know, there is growing demand in China. It's, uh, going to be one of the most rapidly uh, growing nations. Um, it's going to need a great amount of energy, and they're going to get that from a variety of sources, as they already do. But Saudi Arabia will definitely play a major component of that. Um, from the IPO standpoint, um, there has been a lot of speculation about a private sale to uh, China in order to be able to um, reach the valuation or um, hide what the true valuation of Saudi Aramco is. Um, 
So it's a possibility, um, but probably lower on the um, spectrum from some of the other um, uh, stock exchanges uh, that are opportunities out there. Um, I, w I would agree, and I would just add that I think it's more about like, the uh, uh, Chinese interest in, in, in buying uh, or, or taking uh, buying a, a stake in the uh, in Saudi Ramco, and is more about building long-term strategic relations than anything else. Um, you see that with you know even with Saudi Arabia in terms of missile sales from China and things like that. It's more about the long-term relationship than what they're getting out of it now. These systems might be able not be able to be used or anything else. It's more about that long-term strategic relation, especially as I think Saudi Arabia is realizing in certain places that you know the United States is not necessarily the security guarantor that it used to be. Uh, they saw that with the Arab Spring. They kind of saw that with JCPOA. They see that in Yemen now that maybe things are changing. Um, so they're looking for long-term uh, strategic relationships. So, thanks, Paul. I think from a Chinese perspective, it's a buyer's market. And as such, the Chinese are able to impose conditions uh, towards the possibility of a uh, heavy purchase of Aramco through an expanded IPO. Uh, the Chinese have the luxury now to purchase the crew they need from overland pipe from Russia, from tankers coming in from the United States, from Iraq and Iran, who are both producing large volumes of crew to export to China. So an engagement with Aramco, within this perspective, would speak to a strategic relationship, wherein the Chinese would impose a number of conditions, including the trading of the oil contracts in uh, Yuan, now, whether or not the Saudis would be willing uh, to concede uh, on these, and they have to concede, uh, on these conditions, I don't know. Maybe it's the best deal they can make under their circumstance. Maybe they think they can find other ways by which to secure the outside investment they need. We'll have to see. But bottom line, uh, the Chinese are in the driver's seat. Okay, let me give a thank you to our panelists.